going to actually walk through a bit of some of the data from uh, the MarTech, uh, uh, MarTech Day uh, research that we did here over the past few months. Really things that are laying the foundation for what's happening with all the wonderful AI innovation. Uh, and then after setting up a bit of that data that we can use as a backdrop, uh, George and I are going to uh, uh, engage in uh, some conversation beyond that. But of course, you know, uh, to start off, uh, I'm a big fan of marketing software and have been for a couple decades at this point. Uh, I always find this uh, 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 market tunist uh, from Tom Pishper, Warren, uh, we found that our marketing is ineffective and annoying to our potential customers. Uh, and of course, the software guy or software girl is like, hey, with the right software, we can annoy them you know, more effectively. Well, all right. Of course, that's that's not the purpose. Uh, it's to engage them and make them successful and grow our businesses. Uh, there's no doubt, though, that the total just merging between the world of software and technology and marketing uh, has just transformed uh, over this past decade. Uh, I suspect a number of you have seen the MarTech uh, landscape over the years, uh, perhaps uh, witnessed over multiple iterations, this exponential explosion of all these different software products. The most recent version, uh, you know, had now over 14,000 that we cataloged. Uh, and when you zoom in to well, I would say zoom in to read this, but even when you zoom in, you can't read it at this point. Uh, there's a website, martechmap.com. You can go to uh, zoom in and search. But I mean, it's it's crazy, right? Uh, you know, uh, Chief Brody from Jaws would say, we're going to need a bigger slide. In fact, almost just looking at the like micro dots uh, really isn't a way to like fully appreciate the scale of what has happened here with technology over you know the past 10 years of marketing um i think if you put it on a more quantitative uh, uh chart like this it becomes a little bit easier to see that just crazy growth a compound annual growth rate of over 40 percent uh, uh overall from the beginning of tracking this in 2011 to uh, this year talking about 9,300 percent growth in total and then this past year, just when we thought it was safe to go in the water, just when we thought things might starting to be slowing down, well, there was a massive explosion of an additional 27.8% growth. And you can probably take a guess at, hmm, well, what over this past year might have triggered, uh, you know, this explosion of all this innovation? We'll get into that, but you know, one thing I always feel like uh, you know need to just level set on is you know, when people look at this explosion of just thousands and thousands of Martech products. You know, it's it doesn't really do justice to the structure of the industry. It's not like all of these are uh, you know massive Martech companies, and if you ordered these companies based on their scale, uh, the size of their business, their revenue, their customer base, you know, market share. It would, it would be a long tail. You know, you have a relatively small number of uh, companies, mostly public companies at the head, uh, a few hundred uh, companies that are really the, the, the market leaders in their particular specialization or category in the torso, and then thousands and thousands that are in the long tail. And in this long tail, you have like companies that are aspiring to disrupt, uh, you know, the companies that are in the head and the torso, uh, those quickly following the disruptors. You have all sorts of vertical uh, software, uh, regional leaders across the world, uh, software companies that, that specialize in one particular function and they do it better than anyone else. Uh, around large platforms. You also see software products that were built especially for those platforms, these ecosystem software products. And then increasingly services businesses are packaging up their expertise into software that they can deploy with clients as well too. And then way down at the end of the tail, you have folks who are, well, you know, the, the, the classic two people in a garage or, you know, one person in their basement or probably more likely one person at a coffee shop with a laptop, you know, experimenting with things that may or may not become companies as they evolve over time. And everyone's kind of jockeying to, uh, you know, move up uh, this long tail. So this explosion we saw of about 27, 28% growth over this past year, 
almost all of this was due to the disruption around AI, uh, both in its ability to accelerate software growth, but also in the new opportunities that opened up for people to experiment with how AI could reinvent how we do different facets uh, of modern marketing. Now, all the companies that are in the head and the torso and the big ones, you know, in the tail, uh, they have almost all included AI capabilities uh, in their products, you know, but in the tail, this is where we saw over 3,000 net new products that we would call AI native. Now, not all 3,000 of these are going to stick around. Uh, this is the nature of, uh, you know, a very fluid and experimental, you know, technology environment, but some of them will. Uh, and how this evolves is a big part of how we think about architecting the modern MarTech stack to be able to work with this new wave of innovation. And I know it seems like there's a, there's a lot of MarTech companies. Uh, the truth is 14,000 isn't that big of a number in the scheme of things. Uh, you know, G2, uh, you know, which is a software ratings and review, they track 125,000 software companies. Uh, and then if you compare that to uh, like how will marketers ever decide among, you know, 14,000 different MarTech products? Well, you know, if we think about services businesses, the estimate is there's over 400,000 marketing agencies, you know, worldwide. And so we, we live in a world where increasingly there is just a phenomenal amount of choice for every business uh, and the different uh, components of what they can engage. Now, you might say like, OK, wow, with that growing uh, number of software uh, companies and increasingly services businesses also starting to package up software, um, you know, will software companies start to look more like agencies? Will agencies start to look more like software companies? These are some philosophical questions uh, we won't get deep into today, but I think underlying all of this is the recognition that in an age of AI and increasingly connected data across a business's tech stack, there's just going to be a lot more fluidity in the types of software we use and how we manage it. Um, you know, so I did, that's a little bit about the supply side, right? Of, okay, there's all these products being created, but what about the demand side? What about people actually adopting these products? Uh, you know, so we've over the years looked at uh, the composition of MarTech stacks. And one of the things that's been interesting is while products have come and gone within the stack, you know, people are constantly uh, uh, adding new ones, uh, pruning some of the old ones. It's been interesting to see that it's been a relatively stable composition between typically about 17% of the products in the MarTech stack are from those large public companies that we think of in the head of the tail, uh, typically about 33% uh, are those leaders of category leaders in the torso. And then about 50% pretty much year over year for the past seven years has come from the tail. You know, and so even while there's a lot of churn within the tail, uh, you know, companies either they grow and they graduate into the torso or acquired into the torso or they go away and new ones come. You know, what you see is companies are continually experimenting with about half of their MarTech stack in some of these new and emerging technologies. And that's kind of the nature of modern marketing, right? We, we don't chase these things because we like shiny objects. We chase these things because the environment in which we are competing for attention and competing to win, uh, you know, in a highly competitive, uh, you know, global market, um, we are always looking for an edge. And as new technologies change the opportunities for how we engage consumers, how consumers want to engage with us, marketers do have to keep pace with that. Now, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, over the past year here about, you know, the consolidation uh, of the tech stack. And I have good news to report. There has been some consolidation in the tech stack, uh, but, you know, reporting from SaaS management platform Silo, you see, it's actually been a relatively modest amount of consolidation, give or take about 10%, uh, you know, across different sizes of companies, which, again, is healthy. Like, you, you, you want to rationalize your tech stack and only be uh, working with products that you are truly able to get value of out of. And if you have duplicate products or if you have products that aren't delivering value, by all means, to prune them out. But 
even in doing so, we still see that these heterogeneous tech stacks are a big part of how businesses operate today. Um, you know, one other stat from those folks at Zylo, uh, you know, for uh, a company with 500 to 2,500 employees, on average, they add 6.2 new SaaS apps every 30 days. Now, why doesn't this keep just growing to infinity? It's because, well, you know, there is the pruning uh, that happens on the other side. And, you know, we try products and some of them work and some of them don't, you know, but the key thing to take away here is the MarTech stack and the company's tech stacks overall are not static. They are evolving. And so it was really in that context, uh, you know, that my collaborator Franz Ramirezma and I uh, did our research for the State of Martech 2024. Uh, there is a full uh, uh, State of Martech uh, report. Uh, it's uh, 101 pages. Uh, you know, if you're looking to have a nice evening read over a glass of wine, uh, you can pick up a copy of that there. But for today's conversation, I really want to focus in on some of the findings around composability. And you might be scratching your hand and you're like, wait, I, I signed up for I signed up for a webinar about AI. What is this about composability? And I guess I want to like let you in on the secret that it's the composability that is the actual underlying capability that is going to let us do absolutely amazing things uh, with AI. So let's 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 dig into that. So first of all, when we You've probably heard the word composable a fair amount recently. It's become, uh, you know, a, a, a bit of a buzzword. But when you try and get down to like, okay, well, what does this actually mean? You know, you got to step back and recognize that, you know, this idea of composing things, bringing multiple things together, actually does have multiple interpretations in the context of marketing. Uh, when you think about it, you can have, you know, a composed MarTech stack which is where you have multiple different products that you have composed together for your net total capabilities. Almost everybody has a composed stack. You know, inside these tech stacks, we have particular platforms and products, some of whom like specialize in bringing data sets together so that we can activate them uh, in a marketing context. And we think about this, about this as like composed data sets. You know, certainly this is a space where uh, CDPs have been. Uh, we're seeing increasingly more of this happen natively inside the, uh, you know, cloud data warehouses, cloud data lakes as well, too. Then on top of this, um, uh, we have... Workflows, decisioning, you know, these might be workflows of, you know, how things happen backstage, uh, you know, inside the marketing operations team. It might also be ultimately things of like how we handle delivery and decisioning for what we're bringing to uh, uh, consumers. Uh, but it's this idea of composing workflows where workflow might pull data from multiple sources. It might execute services, you know, from multiple different products, you know, but it's trying to orchestrate these pieces towards a larger whole. And then ultimately the, the, you know, sort of the largest, most visible part of composition is very often our websites and our mobile apps, where again, they are bringing together typically a lot of data, a lot of different services, but they are then packaging it into an experience. Now, composability is not new. We have had composability across technology pretty much from the beginning. Uh, and if you sort of think about composing with different things. There's more technical kinds of composition. There's less technical ones. There's things about composing data. There's things about composing services. Just to give a few examples, you know, the way in which software engineers have built software for decades is through composition, that they take code libraries or more recently cloud APIs, you know, and they bring these things together to then compose uh, a net new application uh, and then some of the custom things that they wrap around that. Um, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, uh, you know, when we think about data and non-technical composition, I'd say one of the best analogies is spreadsheets. Um, you know, what is a spreadsheet? It's an environment in which a non-technical person, you know, can pull together data from multiple sources and then manipulate it, uh, you know, to be able to create new insights and new value from it. And then there's like a whole range of, you know, different products that are, you know, have composability to them. What is exciting with AI is AI is simplifying the interface to so many of these products and environments where we've done composition and they are steadily 
shifting from requiring very technical people to do this to increasingly requiring less technical people to do it. You know, a lot of what happened here over the past five, six, seven years with the low code, no code movement was about empowering less technical people to be able to manipulate things that previously, you know, you, know, you needed engineers for. Um, this gets really exciting because a lot of AI interfaces are just shifting that even further to the right. So with that in mind, let's, let's step back and talk about these things that we're composing. So one of the questions we had asked was, okay, what are the different platforms that people have in their MarTech stack? Um, probably not surprising, you know, most people have some sort of marketing automation, engagement platform, uh, you know, like a CRM, uh, DXP, typically a business intelligent platform, lots of different platforms. But when you think about some of the challenges in composition, one of the things is understanding what your centers of gravity are. What are the things that you're using to orchestrate these different pieces? And so we just came right out and asked, you know, uh, you know, from a survey of uh, 163 uh, largely enterprise uh, senior marketing ops, marketing tech leaders, which platform did they consider the center of their MarTech stack for marketing operations? Uh, and, you know, as you probably might have guessed, uh, CRM, uh, marketing automation, CDP, starting to show up increasingly in the data warehouse, um, you know, these account for 86% of the answer. Now, what's interesting is when you segment that for B2B versus B2C, you notice the difference that, uh, you know, the B2B world, you know, has largely built their MarTech stack typically around a CRM or a marketing automation platform. Well, in B2C, this is where we've seen more prevalence of CDPs and increasingly now cloud data warehouses and variations of them. Now, what's exciting from a, uh, a, 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 a MarTech orchestration perspective is for many years, right, we had all these different pieces in our tech stack, but they were not well integrated. And while uh, I will acknowledge for most people, their stack is still not perfectly integrated. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in the industry in this direction. Uh, and so 72% of the folks we talked to said the majority of their stack is now integrated to that center platform. Um, now, one thing that gets us to the reason why we see composability, because there's certainly been this movement, particularly with the large platforms in the head or the torso, you know, to aggregate as much functionality as possible, you know, into their products. But it's interesting that we often see, even with, you know, these very rich full function platforms at the center of the stack, people are sometimes, uh, you know, bringing in other third party products uh, that they use for very specific functionality, even if in theory, that functionality is available in their core platform. It turns out like nearly 83% of the people we surveyed uh, said, yep, we have cases where that is true. Uh, in some cases, uh, like about a third of them said, uh, we have many cases where that's true, which raises a question of like, okay, well, why? Why would you do this? If in theory, you've got this feature here, why would you bring in another product, you know, for that functionality? Uh, and so we asked them and, you know, the number one answer is actually better functionality. You know, and this is important because, you know, sometimes we have things that we say at a high level, like we might say, oh, in this platform, we have the ability to do A-B testing. Um, but when you step back and you start thinking about like, okay, well, what are all the possible ways I could run experiments? You know, how do I manage them? You know, is there an opportunity to get out of this sort of manual A-B testing world? You know, uh, you know, can I bring more AI intelligence to this? These are things where just because a product has a certain testing capability, there very well may be a specialist product out there that can offer a lot richer functionality. Um, the uh, uh, next reason was, you know, for better economics. Um, and again, you might scratch your head at first and say, well, wait a second, I'm buying an additional product to save money. How does that work? Um, and you just have to keep in mind, you know, sometimes a set of functionality inside the, you know, central platform, it might require a separate module. It might be something that's usage based, you know, there very well may be economics for a specific capability that are less expensive 
through a third party product. Another reason, better user experience. And again, this is something that overall, we really do believe, okay, the fewer products that people in our marketing organization have to work with, the, the, the better that experience is. And I think other things being equal, that's true. But other things aren't always equal. You know, Again, when you're looking to do a certain specialized capability, having a product that was fully designed for that capability in mind just gives you the ability to create a, uh, a, a, a much richer and much more um, uh, context-suited uh, experience for helping people be successful with that. And then the last one, which again was a little bit surprising, um, was uh, yeah, nearly 30% saying, well, we, we use these specialist products because we have better governance with them. And this seems counterintuitive at first because you're like, well, wait a second, you know, if I have fewer products, isn't it easier to govern? But there is another dimension to this. You know, again, we were talking here about, um, you know, testing and test management. You know, you can think about all the possible ways in which you might want to structure and manage and govern how certain experimentation is being run, you know, uh, in digital experiences and offers, uh, you know, with your customers. Having product that was actually designed with that in mind, you know, gives you a level of, you know, governance control that you might not get in a more general purpose platform. And so all these things taken together, um, it's interesting is we, we ask those people who do these substitutions more frequently versus less frequently. Uh, and all of those who do it more frequently, uh, you know, actually uh, claim they got those, uh, you know, benefits more, uh, more frequently as well too. Um, you know, that's a bit of a causation versus correlation. Uh, you, you could argue it in either direction, but the reality is folks who are using this composed approach of bringing in certain expert capabilities across their stack um, are, are doing so in a very intentional and rational way. And then I want to give you like one example, and then, uh, you know, I'm going to turn this over here to George, uh, who has some perspective uh, on this, and uh, we'll uh, have a fun conversation there. Um, but I want to make this very concrete, right? So I'm talking a little bit uh, abstractly with some of this data. I want to give the example of the data layer and the composition that's happening in MarTech stacks around cloud data warehouses and data lakes. Um, now, this data is through the lens of, again, marketing operations, marketing tech leaders at largely uh, mid-market and enterprise companies. So a little bit more on the sophisticated side, um, but it was really interesting to see that uh, for this audience set, 70% of them now are at the point where they have integrated their MarTech stack with a cloud data warehouse. Uh, uh, some are doing it for one-way data from the stack down to the warehouse for analytics purposes. Some are starting to take advantage of pulling data from the warehouse to help hydrate uh, new use cases inside their MarTech platforms. But a huge portion are actually now doing this bi-directionally, uh, that it is truly becoming an interactive data layer powering the overall MarTech stack. And for those who have, uh, you know, a, a cloud data warehouse data lake in their MarTech stack, um, uh, it was really exciting to see that over 61% of them have 50% or more of the applications across their MarTech stack integrated um, to the cloud data warehouse. And so this is where um, this is where things get really exciting for us. You know, for years we talked about consolidation in MarTech of like, hey, there's all these different products and we have all these things in our stack and can we can just consolidate the market in our stack down to, you know, five. Um, and, and while there's been enormous effort, uh, you know, uh, you know, across the industry to do so, it's clearly failed miserably, right? We are, we are not a consolidated industry at this point. We are a heterogeneous, diverse uh, industry. And with AI, we seem to be getting even more, uh, you know, diversity and emerging innovation. But we do have the option to bring order to this chaos through the concept of aggregation which is to say, okay, it's not so much about reducing the total number of things that exist inside your business or inside your tech stack, but it's about having these centers of gravity that are able to aggregate 
how we manage uh, data coming from multiple sources and destinations to aggregate how we think about decisioning and you know workflow across our organization to aggregate the experiences that we deliver to our employees that we deliver to our customers um, and this is where things get really exciting because from an aggregation point of view, you know, it's not about getting rid of all these other things, but it's about providing a simplified way of orchestrating how they work together. And so on that, that note, um, I'm going to turn this over to you, George. Thank you so much, Scott. Really, really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk about the AI decisioning layer in the composable stack. So Scott Scott referenced how how um, the the composability of the stack and the increasing understanding that that's that's just the way the the natural way it's going to be has implications for AI and and opposite in the other direction. And so I'm going to talk about what that means specifically for AI decisioning in the context of CRM lifecycle marketing. Uh, so first, before I get into that, you know, why, why am I talking on this on this topic? Why AI decisioning? Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of OfferFit. We're a technology company that provides AI testing for marketers. Customers include Yelp, MetLife, and many other leading brands. We're a team of about 100, 100 people, growing growing quickly as enterprises adopt the technology. Today, we're going to cover four things. First, we're actually going to take a step back and just talk about what is machine learning and what are the four subtypes of machine learning. That'll give us a foundation to ask, what is next best action, which many of you may have heard of. It's the traditional way to do machine learning driven decision. And then we'll talk about the new state of the art that's that's starting to replace it called AI testing. And then finally, what does that mean for the composable MarTech stack? And we'll tie it into many of the points, Scott, you just made in, in your presentation. My hope for this talk is that we'll open up the black box a little bit. I feel like AI and ML for marketers often does feel like a black box where you may have either technologies that you're using or your colleagues in the data science part of your org that build certain models. But as a marketer, it can often feel very, very obscure and hard to know exactly what's going on in those models. What are they doing? And so hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, it'll feel a little bit, a little bit less like a black box. So this is an example of a, of a question we would ask in classical statistics, which by the way, is not as old a field as you may think. Classical statistics was mostly developed in the first half of the 20th century. You might have uh, a data set of individuals and you know how long each of them has been a customer and what the revenue was in the, in the month following that. And in classical statistics, you would fit a line to this data. You can think of fitting this line as learning from the data. You have some historical data, you fit a line, and now because you've learned from that data, you're able to make new predictions. So you have maybe a new customer that you didn't previously analyze in this data set, and you can predict for them how much revenue you're going to get in the next month. Now, of course, in real life, data does not always look like a beautiful straight line. You actually want to fit, you know, you, you can sort of fit a straight line to data that doesn't look linear, but really you'd want to do something like this, right? You'd want a shape that reflects the actual shape of the data. People didn't study that very much in classical statistics. And the reason has to do with computation. In order to fit something that is not a straight line to data, you need to do way more calculations than it's practical to do with pencil and paper or with slide rules. And so as a result, you could theoretically try to study this, but it didn't have any practical implications if you're doing this in 19, 1940 or 1950. That all changed in the 80s and 90s as a lot more compute became available. And so now it actually became practical to fit these more complicated shapes to data. And the field that came out of that was called machine learning. Just as we talked about how that straight line was learning from the data, that's why machine learning is called machine learning. It's also learning from the data to make new predictions, but using the power of machines, computers, in order to be able to do that in not necessarily linear situations. Uh, now, of course, in real life, it's not quite so simple that you have just one input variable. You might have several, you know, three or 300. But in this case, you might take years as customer, purchases in the last 90 days, whether someone's in the loyalty program, yes or no, feed it into a linear model and get an output, which is the prediction for that person of the next month revenue. And with machine learning, it's actually the same structure. You put in the exact same data that you would enter into a linear model, and then it outputs something. Uh, but that is a nonlinear 
uh, function of the input data. And the reason you do that is in hopes that you can get more accurate predictions coming out of these nonlinear models than you could out of the linear models. But essentially, it's serving the exact same purpose. So the way I like to think about it is machine learning, uh, it, it has this mystique to it, right? AI and machine learning. But in fact, it's just a generalization of classical statistics. It turns out that statistics, when taken to its logical conclusion, becomes this, this magical thing that leads to things like chat GPT. Now, of course, the types of nonlinear models are, you know, they, they have fancy names like neural networks, like large language models are examples of neural networks, gradient boosting machines, support vector machines. But they all do essentially uh, this very simple task of establishing patterns between inputs and outputs that are not necessarily linear. Now, specifically within machine learning, there are four main subtypes. And these four subtypes are all, uh, they also have technical names, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, generative AI reinforcement learning. And they're all used in, in marketing. So for, and we'll go through each one of them really quickly, but what you should understand about them is that they share a common toolkit. So there's, there's a common set of tools that gets used across all of machine learning, but also uh, there's, a, there's a specialized sub toolkit for each of these fields. So for example, um, a lot of the breakthroughs in generative AI were made using very specialized model types for that task. Uh, but for example, large language models are neural networks and neural networks is very much a general machine learning technique that gets used across all four of these types of machine learning. And so in marketing, for example, prediction is used for things like propensity to repurchase. You can build what's called a supervised learning model. You'll give it data and it'll output for a given individual, how likely are they to make another repurchase? Pattern identification is when you're not trying to make a prediction, you're merely observing and detecting automatically patterns within the data. Great marketing example is lookalike audiences. When you give Facebook a set of people and you say, find other people who look like them, you're not asking Facebook to make any kind of prediction. You're just asking it to detect a pattern for people who are similar. And then generation, we're all very familiar with, with chat GPT and other generative models. And then finally, decisioning. So decisioning is when you're not asking your model to make a prediction or detect a pattern, you're asking it to actually select an action in order to maximize some, some reward function. And that's, that's offer fits focus and what we'll spend most of this time discussing. So let's talk about next best action, which, uh, which many of you have heard about in the context of life cycle or CRM marketing when you have an audience of identified individuals and you want to select the best thing to do for each person. The traditional next best action way of doing this is that you would build predictive machine learning models. So these are models that are in that first bucket that we just looked at for your customer base. So these are things like propensity to churn on a score of zero to 100. How likely is each person to churn in the next three months? Propensity to repurchase or affinity for certain categories. And so you end up with a score for each person. Now, of course, that's just the first step because prediction is not the same as decisioning. The example that I like uh, here is I am the, the parent of a toddler. And so I actually have a very high category affinity for diapers. My wife and I buy a lot of diapers. That does not necessarily mean that when you market to me, you should send me emails reminding me to buy more diapers. How many diapers I buy is going to depend much more on my son's digestion that month than it is on how you may market to me about diapers. So having a high affinity does not mean that is the right thing to be, to be doing in terms of a marketing action that will drive incrementality. And so in next best action, you need to take an additional step before you can turn these predictive scores into decisions. And the way you do that is you take your audience and you segment it using the scores. So for example, you might take the propensity to churn and divide people into five groups based on their churn scores. You would do the same thing for category affinity and you end up with 25 segments. So each of those segments is a group of customers that are similar to each other in that they have similar churn scores and similar category affinity for baby products. And then you would do a lot of A-B testing to figure out what is the best policy or what's the best rule for how you're gonna market to each of these segments of customers. So you can probably already see some of the problems with this traditional next best action approach. Let's take a look at these two customers, Benjamin and Michael. They are in the same segment because they have a very similar churn score and a similar category affinity to baby products, but it might be for very different reasons. 
Benjamin recently had a bad customer service experience, and that's why he has a high churn score. Michael is a college senior who's about to graduate, and he's going to move to a different city. And that's why he has a similarly high churn score. They also have a mid-range category affinity for baby products. It's because Benjamin is a, is a grandfather and he buys, you know, he's a pretty indulgent grandfather. He buys toys occasionally for his grandkids. Michael did some babysitting as he was putting himself through college and, you know, just to earn some extra money. And so he occasionally would buy baby products for the children he was babysitting. So you can see that these two individuals actually are going to be treated identically by our next best action model because they end up in the same segment. But they ended up in that segment for extremely different reasons. And really, we should be marketing very differently to them. So for example, maybe Michael needs some kind of coupon that will encourage him after he moves to still go to the store that's you know with our company and resume his habit of shopping with us. What Benjamin needs is probably a phone call and an apology to do some service recovery for the bad customer service experience that he had. But Next Best Action isn't going to allow us to detect any of these things. But in fact, we have data about these folks that, that might have that information. We know how long they've been a customer, responses to satisfaction surveys. We might know that Benjamin recently had a bad experience with customer service. Basket sizes, purchase frequencies, web browsing behavior, and, and so on. But in next best action, we're completely ignoring this data beyond using it to put people in a broad segment. And so you feel when you're doing this traditional next best action, like you're being very modern and very personalized. You're using machine learning, that's cool. You're taking all your first party data. You're putting all of that into these models, wonderful. You're not really though extracting the true signal that's in your first party data because you're going through the step where you boil everybody down to segments and then you treat them identically from that point on. There's a second problem with, with this construct um, and that's that it is very operationally difficult to maintain. I mentioned that the way you derive the rules for these segments is through A-B testing. The alternative to that is you could just do something that's assumptive without doing any testing. Although I like to call that next best guess rather than next best action. If you want to be empirical about it, you're going to have to do tests. If you have 25 segments, which is on the low end for a next best action setup, uh, you better be prepared to do an awful lot of A-B testing. And so here's an AI generated image of someone waiting for those A-B tests to reach statistical significance. So when you're operating this traditional next best action construct, every time you want to make a change, you're going to be retesting and rerunning tests on all of that stuff. So my co-founder, Victor, uh, realized these problems when a few years ago, when he was a consultant with the Boston Consulting Group, and he, he specialized in building machine learning models custom for companies, he started doing this type of next best action. He said, oh, wait a second, um, there's actually a branch of machine learning uh, called reinforcement learning, where these models, they're also called agents, specialize in outputting decisions. The problem with next best action is the problem you're trying to solve is a decisioning problem, but you're not actually using machine learning that it is built natively for decisioning. You're using predictive models. So you're using things from the first bucket and you're shoehorning them into doing decisioning through this very intricate network of segments and A-B tests, which is very inefficient. Now, it's very understandable that that's how it used to be because this decisioning type of machine learning is a more recently developed type of AI. Uh, it wasn't really well understood uh, even, even 10, 15 years ago, but now it's much better understood. And so Victor was looking at this and he said, wait a second, there's actually a, a much more modern, better approach to this problem. So with a reinforcement learning agent, your inputs are gonna be similar to your next best action inputs that you would put in your predictive models. It's things like your customer characteristics. But the outputs are not predictions. It's not saying this customer left to their own devices has this propensity to churn. It's actual literal decisions. It's saying for this person, if your goal is to maximize revenue or profit or something else, here's the incentive you should send them, or here's the channel, or here's the time. Because when you set up one of these reinforcement learning agents, that's how you set it up. You tell it, here's the reward that I want you to maximize. Here are the actions that are available to you. And now go try different things out and figure it out. And these agents then learn autonomously. And so that's a process that we call AI testing. You can think of it as a synonym basically for reinforcement learning because it replaces this manual process of A-B testing. You're using reinforcement learning in order to autonomously test and personalize.
Here's how it works in practice. It sits between your data systems, like a warehouse or CDP and marketing automation, whether you're using OfferFit for this or any other approach to AI testing. And then it's a feedback loop. So on the first day, um, your AI testing tool is gonna make decisions. For this customer, send them this email through this, uh, you know, with this subject line, with this incentive. For this other person, take this other action. That gets activated through your existing marketing automation. And then a few days later, the AI testing tool can look and see, I made this set of decisions. Here's what came of them. Here's where I was able to get more reward or less reward. Reward might be revenue or conversions. And based on that, it starts to learn and get smarter. And it never stops experimenting and learning, but every day it gets a little bit smarter and better at tailoring its decisions to each individual based on all of the data that it has about them. So uh, one example is uh, a customer of ours is a leading credit card company, and they used AI testing in order to uh, personalize initially their refer a friend campaign. And I like this example because they have a very sophisticated marketing team known to be one of the biggest, most, uh, most advanced marketing teams in the, in the industry. And they had already A-B tested this journey very thoroughly. So they knew what's the best subject line, what's the best time of day, day of the week, and so forth. And the reason they wanted to use AI testing and, and worked with OfferFit to, to do this is they wanted to take it to the next level. It wasn't enough to be sending whatever's generically the best subject line. They knew that for some people, actually the best subject line wasn't the best. The best for them was, was a different one. And so they wanted to extract more uplift by personalizing. And by the end of their initial pilot, this was a couple of years ago, uh, they'd already generated 92% uplift in conversions towards the end of that pilot after the agents had learned a lot. And that translated in about 16 million of annualized bottom line benefit. So based on that, they uh, they ended up expanding uh, this to to all the different points in their in their customer journey. Another example is a leading review app, uh, which you may have on your phone, and uh, it's a place you can get you know restaurant reviews and for other small businesses or large businesses. And so uh, they're they're using AI testing to personalize who do you send a push notification about plumbers versus nightlife how frequently, time of day, day of the week, uh, and, and which one with which messaging. And also saw quite a bit of uplift in push to session conversion rate. So there's just a couple of examples to bring it to light. So the, the way that um, I like to think about it is it's, it's moving from next best action to next best everything. And it's next best everything in, in two ways. First of all, in next best action, you think that you're inputting very rich data and you're using all your first party data. That's only sort of true. You're boiling people down to segments. Whereas when you're using AI testing, you're actually using all of your first party data in order to make decisions. And second of all, with next best action, it's really hard to use it for more than one dimension or two dimensions of your decision. Like imagine if you have a churn score that you're inputting in a category affinity. That might give you some information in order to decision on, um, for example, which incentive to give someone, but it's not really helpful for decisioning on the right channel to communicate with them on or the right day of the week. Whereas with AI testing, because you're taking all of the first party data, you can actually use it to make decisions on everything that are actually gonna be high quality decisions because the AI testing agents will pick out and figure out on their own which of the data about customers is relevant and should be used to tailor the day of the week versus incentives versus which product to talk about and so forth. So the other thing that's important to know is AI testing um, and, and AI decisioning, which to me, AI testing is really the right way to do AI decisioning because decisioning only works well if it's empirically based, right? Decisioning only makes sense if you've experimentally established that you're making the right decisions instead of just some kind of decision. Um, it, it's, not, it's not trivial. It's a very specialized field because what you need is first of all, you need configurable AI testing agents to properly do this type of decisioning. You need diagnostic dashboards so that when you make adjustments, because this is not like your traditional software where it's deterministic. And if it's been tested well, you sort of know what it's gonna do. These are complex AI agents and you need to be able to monitor them and make sure they're performing well. And when you make certain tweaks, you need to be able to check the performance. And what that means is you need to build highly specialized diagnostic dashboards to be able to conveniently do that. Um, you need expert AI services. For similar reasons, um, these are not, uh, no, no matter how appealing it would be, it's just not plug and play when you're using this properly as an enterprise. If as an enterprise, you're implementing AI testing, you're gonna wanna put in your own custom data. You're gonna have some custom KPI that you're seeking to maximize. 
it's probably not going to be email opens, right? It might be revenue or profit or net present value if you have some kind of internal model for that. You're gonna have custom guardrails that you put on it. And so what that means is um, you, you need um, expert AI services that go alongside with this product, uh, whoever your provider is, so that you can make sure that this is actually being set up appropriately and you're gonna be getting uplift. And finally, self-serve interfaces and reports. So as a marketer, you can actually see what's, what's happening and continuously monitor and extract insights. So what do I think this means for the composable tech stack? I think Scott shared uh, what are some of those platforms that people see as core. And so I'm just gonna talk through what at least my prediction is for how this is going to evolve. And we'll start with a historical retrospective. Around the year 2010, this was the archetypal CRM stack. Uh, the marketing automation platform is very much at the core. I think in the data, Scott, that you shared, most people still see it as perhaps their most central uh, platform, even though that's that's starting to, to shift over time. And then there were various apps, right, that, that connect to the marketing automation platform. And then I think what we saw change in, in, in recent years is now the data system is becoming clearly another core platform. And companies would have around 2020, they'd, they'd typically choose, right? They'd have a CDP or they might have a warehouse or maybe different teams would use different ones. And then that connects to the marketing automation platform. And then there's other apps that get added onto that. Now we're seeing a shift towards composable CDPs. People have realized that storing data and duplicating that across warehouses and CDPs is very inefficient and gets very expensive and difficult to maintain. So now you have a composable CDP which seeds the, the primary repository of data role to the warehouse, but provides a lot of the connectivity, um, identity resolution, a lot of these other marketing facing functionality to marketers. And so now you have kind of these, these three uh, core platforms. And of course, not all companies are here, but the companies that are probably the furthest along, their tech stack is more likely to look like this tech stack. And most companies are gradually moving in this direction. And then my prediction is we're gonna see um, an AI decisioning platform emerge as a fourth core, core platform. And we're already seeing it in, for example, those customers of ours uh, that are furthest along on their journey, because you really need to bridge your warehouse and your marketing automation platform. And that process of making decisions is first of all, very strategic. So it's very core to your performance as, as a business. But second of all, it's very specialized. So to Scott's point about composability, it's not something that's a commodity that if there's a switch inside your marketing automation platform that does it like sort of badly, it's like, well, that's fine. Like we'll, we'll flip that switch, it's already built in. Uh, no, you actually care about these decisions being made in the best possible way, because that's, that's very core to how you interact with your customer base and is very tied to financial value that you get from your CRM journeys. And so as a result, uh, companies clearly want um, best of breed for that, as opposed to something that's, uh, that, you know, enough to get the job done on a, on a basic level, but isn't really going to perform well. And here's a somewhat cheesy analogy uh, to, to, to what these are. The warehouse is the bones, right? That's the data. That's the core foundation of any kind of modern business. Uh, CDP is the connective tissue, right? A composable CDP on itself maybe isn't the, it's not the bones, but it's, it's just as important because it's going to link everything and allow everything to talk to each other whether it's stitching together data, whether it's activating based on the data and so forth. The AI decisioning platform is the brain and the marketing automation platform, that's where execution happens, that's, that's the muscle. So che cheesy, cheesy, but, um, but I think, I think uh, pre pretty accurate to how companies use these. So if I were to summarize, first of all, machine learning, uh, it's just statistics. There's not that much mysterious about it. But it's generalized from linear situations, which is classical statistics, to nonlinear situations made possible by the power of compute. And so statistics turns out to be quite magical when it's taken to its full logical conclusion. There are four overall distinct types of machine learning. They get used for different purposes, even though they share a common toolkit, prediction, pattern identification, generation, and decisioning. The traditional approach to decisioning in CRM, which is called next best action, takes predictive machine learning and combines it with segment-based rules, usually derived through A-B testing. Uh, it's very cumbersome, and it's also not very personalized by the drawbacks. And that's being replaced by AI testing, which uses a type of machine learning natively built for decisioning. The technical name for it is reinforcement learning. And as a result, you end up with a much less cumbersome uh, um, setup, but also more personalized decisions. And finally, as composability continues, continues progressing, 
in this new composable CRM stack for core systems, enterprises are going to look to best of breed for those. And, and AI testing and AI decisioning is going to be one of those. So we're going to see a new decisioning layer emerge over the coming decade uh, in the tech stack. Uh, if folks are interested in learning more, uh, for qualifying companies, we offer a no-cost on-site one-day AI Academy. And so you could have uh, a group of two or three um, AI experts from, from OfferFid come and join you, and it's an interactive workshop session. Uh, companies that have done it say it's it's very helpful in, in further demystifying this stuff. So if you're interested, feel free to either either send us a note or you can you can submit your interest at this address right here. And with that, uh, Nathaniel and Scott, over over to you guys for the Q and A. Awesome. So I want to first of all thank you everyone uh, for for your attention and interest. And if if folks have have questions, please please put them in the chat or, or Q and A. Um, Scott, I'm curious how just for you to react, react a little bit to what George has said, he's sort of giving a little bit of predictions of where we're going to see the market head. Um, I'm not asking for spoilers in the sense of, of ongoing research, but like, how does that track with what you're seeing in the market as you talk to? Are you hearing about this decisioning layer? Um, just what, what are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, I think there's a very clear analogy. Uh, and so when I had originally uh, looked at where I saw the centers of aggregation inside the tech stack, the way I framed it was like, okay, well, there's a data layer. You need something that's going to be the center of gravity for that. That's what we're seeing is the data warehouse. Uh, there was what I coined a workflow layer, uh, which is very much this orchestration of how things flow throughout your organization. And a lot of that was you know, driven by companies like iPaaS, workflow automation, folks, but it was very, very much an internal operations uh, capability. And then on top of that, aggregation that happens around experiences, experiences for employees or experiences for customers. You know, one of the things I realized I had missed in that model, uh, partly because the technology just wasn't ready yet, is it isn't really a workflow layer between the data and the experience, that it is this broader set of how do we make decisions? How do things flow, not just from an internal operations perspective, but how they can flow uh, um, through the decisions we make about the interactions to have with customers too. So I definitely see that, um, yeah, I mean, this is what's so exciting about uh, so many so many aspects of the modern MarTech stack uh, that AI is taking things that were either just uh, impossible maybe is a bit of a strong word, but like we're just the the effort and work required to do uh, manually, just put them out of reach, you know, and this generation of AI technologies that we're seeing is now actually making a lot of that accessible. And so, yeah, I think uh, uh, there are certainly other examples of this popping up throughout the, you know, MarTech industry, um, but I think George's model there of a decisioning layer between the data uh, and the execution there is absolutely coming to fruition. So we have a, a question for the audience, um, I guess, for either of you is, what do you think is the um, competitive advantage that that a company has if, if their marketing stack has this kind of decisioning layer versus not? Like what's sort of the, the bottom line or competitive benefit to having the layer? Uh, yeah, maybe I can share my thoughts on Scott. We'd love to hear yours. Um, uh, the way that, um, that one of our customers has described this is it it gives their company a way of holistically managing the customer life cycle uh, in, in an intelligent way. So typically when you have companies that don't use an AI decisioning layer, um, they end up having to run siloed rules-based campaigns, right? So like you run your emails campaigns or maybe you have some journey, but then everybody goes into the journey that meets some relatively um, crude criterion. And so what that means is you're often gonna be over discounting if you have incentives in your business because you're not able to pick out the people that don't need discounts. You're going to be over communicating to some customers and getting them to unsubscribe. You're going to be under communicating to other customers. And so just the, the, the way that you're interacting with your customer base in pretty much every aspect through all of your channels is going to be less, less coordinated and it's gonna be ultimately erosive to your margins and your revenue growth as a company. And so by adding a decisioning layer, the way that I, at least I see companies think about it, it's how can you make sure you don't have to make trade-offs between margin and growth? Because if you're making those decisions at the individual customer level, 
you're able to put the right product with the right incentive, if any, in front of every customer to actually do what's accretive to your business in every situation, instead of having to make these very inefficient trade-offs. So, so at the end of the day, those companies will have the advantage of having much more coherent interactions with their customers and able to truly control the customer lifecycle in a personalized way, um, in a way that maximizes the success of their business. So Scott, I don't know if you have a kind of similar or different perspective on that question. I I, th I think you nailed it. I would simply say like, you know, if there's been a uh, gold ring that, um, you know, marketing's been searching for from the very beginning uh, of the internet, it was this true one-to-one -one personalization, you know, but we, we never really got there. You know, I mean, most personalization uh, was <laughs> glorified mail merge, uh, maybe with a little bit of like prediction on like, oh, well, let's show them these products instead of these other products. I think one of the things you uh, did a wonderful job in clarifying in your presentation is you think about all these different facets of what goes into the decisions of how we engage an individual uh, customer. And that's the kind of personalization that we've always wanted. And again, up until very recently, the technology just hadn't been there to even make that possible. So I think, yeah, as a competitive advantage, if your company can truly do that uh, and your competitors aren't there yet, um, by all means, yeah, that, that, that is uh, 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 technology arbitrage. <laughs> so I, I think we have time for one last question, which is what are some of the challenges to um, being part of this new, new wave and having an AI decisioning layer in your stack? Yeah, I mean, I think one prerequisite is just maturity of the other components of the stack. So uh, one example is the data layer. If a company, for example, hasn't unified their data in a warehouse or, or CDP, then they're just not ready. And so if they embark on something like this, they'll find that they're going to have a lot of implementation challenges because their data isn't going to be unified and, and mature enough for that. Um, the other thing is it relates to this point of the expert services. Because it is a very specialized subfield of machine learning, you need to make sure that when you're doing it, you're you're not going into it with a kind of naive approach that like, oh yeah, this is easy. There's some out of the box thing and you press a button and then it magically works. You actually need pretty sophisticated tooling. Um, so for example, companies that have built this in-house successfully, I only know of two or three examples and they had teams of like 50 plus full-time permanent senior engineers on it. So you just need to go into this, you know, if you partner with somebody like, like for example, if you partner with OfferFit, you also need to understand it's going to require work from both sides. Typically about two months of an install requires collaboration and partnership. Uh, and, and it requires a services team from us to be involved. So to me, it's it's the payout is, is really large to getting this right. But you also need to go into it understanding that A, you need to have your foundations in place. And B, B you know, it, it requires thoughtful, thoughtful work to make sure it truly performs well. Hey, I, I think um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so we're going to leave it there. But thank you so much, Scott and George, for such a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in.